try to try to make sure that I get this right um, because I think it's a really important question. Last week, you may have noticed a pretty amazing viral video by a politician called Beto O'Rourke, who is running for Senate in Texas. What people were really amazed by in this video is how an incredibly authentic, compassionate, and also truthful way Beto responded to a question about basically racism in America and coming to terms with that history and looking forward. And what people may not have realized was that the mechanics of what Beto did is actually something we all can do. It's a way of communicating called nonviolent communication. So I interviewed a woman named Erin Maryhew, who is a trainer of nonviolent communication, and I'm going to show you what she has to say. And then we're going to look at Beto's video and actually point out the ways that he used these methods and I promise you you are actually going to be more impressed with him after you see how he did it than you are now. So let's go to the interview with Aaron. Today I'm with Aaron Maryhew who is a leadership coach who is also a trainer in nonviolent communication which she will explain. So first off Aaron, what, what is nonviolent communication? Great question. So um, a lot of people ask me that. Um, personally, I don't love that term because it is so confusing to people who are just mm -hmm. engaging with it for the first time. Um, so the founder of nonviolent communication was a man named Marshall Rosenberg, and he actually chose the term nonviolent not to indicate that people who are violent need this, but more so to align with Gandhi's movement of nonviolence. And the Hindi word for nonviolence is ahimsa. And it has an alternate um, translation that I really identify with. And that is a state of the heart that has no enemies. So that's really at the, uh, the foundation of this work is how do we move in the world uh, in a way that we don't have enemies. That's beautiful. And so, and so relevant at this time in our nation's history. So, um, I guess we should think of some kind of a scenario that we can work through. Maybe someone is expressing a view we disagree with, or bashing or promoting a candidate, or something that, that is upsetting to us. And kind of how can we deal with it in a way that actually helps us to continue to work with that person? Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Yeah, so um, the first thing is to acknowledge that the lens most of us are looking through when we perceive a comment or uh, we see a headline is do I agree with this or do I disagree with this? And so it's the most common lens that I see um, when looking at um, a political situation. And um, I don't want to get rid of that lens altogether, but I want to invite another lens that we would adopt. And that lens is what is important to this person. So uh, rather than just looking at do I agree or disagree, actually putting your attention on what is it that this person cares about that I care about too? So mm -hmm. um, looking at my own experience and then getting curious about the other person's experience. The only thing I would say is, mm -hmm. in my experience, I can't do one without doing the other. Mm -hmm. So if I'm only putting myself, myself in the other person's shoes and trying to figure out what's important mm -hmm. to them, I may be losing connection with right. what's going on with me. And then the way I respond is not going to feel authentic because I've lost mm -hmm. connection with myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right, because we, you're not suggesting that people appease someone who may be saying something that is, that is aggressive, that there's, there's two things going on there. There's, there's ourselves and the other that are equally, yeah. Yeah, yeah and, and kind of in that same vein of not appeasing, um, mm -hmm. you know, so much of what is important in building collaborative relationships mm -hmm. is not about agreeing with each other mm -hmm. or, or saying, um, yes, we're on the same page. It's about, do I understand the other person and have I demonstrated that they matter and that they have dignity? Mm -hmm. Because when I do that, they will return that to me. Mm -hmm. So if I demonstrate, I could really disagree. I could have a radically different viewpoint. If I have opened my heart to the other person's perspective and I respond to them in a way that maintains their dignity and lets them know you're being heard we understand, mm -hmm. they are very likely to meet that 
energy of, mm-hmm. wow, I'm, I'm seen here, I matter here. And they were like really get curious. So let's see how better, better does this. So he is a real pro at this. So he knocked off moving beyond degree to disagree and showing that he believes in the dignity of the person he's talking to within the first few seconds of his response. Reasonable people. Reasonable people can disagree on this issue. Let's begin there. And it makes them no less American to come down on a different conclusion on this issue, right? Um, You can feel as a young man does, you can feel as I do, you're every bit as American all the same. And we can't see exactly the mechanics of all this going through his head. But in terms of the second point is what is important to both of them. He identifies really quickly that there is importance of veterans and the dignity of veterans because um, the young man says that he has veterans in his family, um, and also the idea of patriotism and Americanness. I wanted to know if you found that disrespectful to our country, to our veterans, and anybody related to that. So first, Beto makes a comment specifically recognizing the dignity and contribution of veterans. Is it disrespectful to this country, to the flag, to service members who are right there tonight where it is tonight in Afghanistan, and those former service members, retirees, and veterans who are here with us today? Thank you each for your service. And at multiple other points, and particularly at the dramatic conclusion of his remarks, he references Americanness. So he's basically done done everything before he even gets into the history of the civil rights movement and its continuation today. The thing that is most impressive, I think, is that he does all this and he is also authentic to himself. So he also expresses, no, I do not believe it is disrespectful for athletes to take a knee. My, my short answer is no. I don't think it's disrespectful. When he speaks about the history, he's speaking about what matter, things that matter to him. Um, the freedoms that we have were purchased not just by those in uniform, and they definitely were, but also by those who took their lives into their hands riding those Greyhound buses, the Freedom Riders, in the Deep South in the 1960s. So he doesn't appease the individual. He doesn't give a soft and fuzzy answer. Um, that is subtly racist, but doesn't challenge the views of people um, who may not understand what taking knee is about. He expresses his view clearly, um, but he does so in a way that also values the young man who asked the question. And um, it's just beautiful. So let's end on that last note um, about being American and how it is something that by the end encompasses himself, the individual who has the question, and the individuals who are protesting. So everyone gets to belong to this idea, this valued idea of Americanness. I can think of nothing more American than to peacefully stand up or take a knee for your rights anytime, anywhere, any place. So if you're interested in, still interested in learning more about nonviolent communication, I'm going to link below to some uh, resources from Aaron on getting deeper into nonviolent communication and also to Marshall Rosenberg's book, which is really um, a good read. So yeah, my next video should be from the road.